So welcome to the first in a series of videos trying to uh, uh, show some evidence for evolutionary theory. We're ultimately going to try and support all three of these ideas. In this particular video, we're just going to discuss the first. So this idea that species actually do change over generations. Something that isn't immediately obvious. It doesn't seem to us that the species around us are, are changing. Um, and that's because most species um, have such a long generation time that we can't really see hundreds of generations in our own human lifespan. And so there's kind of two strategies to maybe thinking about the idea that we can actually show species changing. Uh, maybe in some cases we could really study just species that reproduce very fast um, so that we can actually see hundreds or even thousands of generations within our own lifetime. And um, the second strategy is going to go to the fossil record and I'll kind of discuss these in turn. So what is a really fast reproducing species that we could actually show changing? Um, a wonderful example would generally be bacterial species. There are many species of bacteria, uh, but in particular I want to address some of the species that cause disease. So there are certain bacteria that get in us and they kind of make their living by making us sick so that they can spread from human host to human host. And um, starting maybe in the uh, kind of the 1940s, we were finally able to mass produce chemicals that, that kill bacterial cells specifically. Penicillin was a very, the, kind of the very famous first one. And they all belong to a broad class of medicines that we call antibiotics. And antibiotics are just chemicals that, that destroy bacterial cells specifically. Uh, for example, penicillin destroys bacteria by kind of uh, finding a particular component of their cell wall and sort of um, inhibiting their ability to build their cell wall correctly. So that kills them. Um, very successful drugs at first, um, but as time progressed, we started to see uh, uh, pathogenic bacteria or bacteria that cause disease become more and more resistant to the medications that, that we used to be able to give and would really clear out the problem quickly. Um, and this kind of resistance to our medications is something that Darwin could have very easily predicted from his um, ideas of how change works. So, you know, just the evidence for this particular idea is just to note that we have uh, hospitals and doctors and nurses have seen bacterial disease become harder and harder to treat, and we've had to switch to new types of antibiotics. And really, we're going to send you to several um, explorations in my class that really talk about how this is becoming more and more scary in our modern times. Uh, but just um, to walk through Darwin's theory one more time, let's see if we can apply his four steps to explain how bacteria might have changed to become resistant to the medications that kill them. So um, the first thing to note is that they wouldn't have done that until we started taking these medications so much and providing an environment that makes it hard for them to survive. So until we started taking antibiotic biotic medications so much, there really wasn't the selective pressure that drove them to um, eventually evolve a solution. If you have a selective pressure and if you have genetic variety, maybe there's just natural variety that exists among bacterial individuals in terms of how much they, they are susceptible to antibiotics. So maybe um, some bacteria get killed very easily with antibiotics and other bacteria just have ways that make them survive the antibiotic. In many cases, bacteria just release chemicals themselves that destroy the antibiotic before it harms their cells. Um, and so maybe if you have a population um, where they're relatively susceptible to the drug um, early in antibiotics history, then when you take the drug, it kills lots of them. Um, but maybe in some cases, some lucky individuals survive. And that's really the idea of the selection of particular individuals. Maybe with individuals who survived were then able to reproduce um, organisms that were genetically resistant just like them. And then if you propose that happening over many generations, then maybe 60 or 70 years later, after the introduction of certain antibiotics, we're really starting to notice the change um, and how much more difficult it is to treat bacterial infection. 
Okay, so um, let's move on to our second piece of evidence. In some cases, we aren't able to directly witness the change ourselves, so maybe we can go back to the fossil record then with fossils that we've been able to find. The fossil record is kind of unfortunately incomplete because in some cases we just haven't found certain fossils. Um, in some cases, uh, it's just hard for us to access them in particular areas. Uh, but even the fossils that we have been able to find have really showed uh, a story of change. And so just a very famous example of that would be the change in the uh, long ago ancestors of modern whale species. Whales are really interesting animals because they obviously live in the ocean, and yet they're clearly mammals. And we find almost all other mammal species on land. Uh, whales still have lungs that they use to breathe, so they're going to have to surface um, uh, to the surface of the ocean in order to take in air, and then they obviously submerge again. Um, they still nurse their young with milk, and so all of these um, are suggestive that maybe long ago whale ancestors were on land, and then they changed over many generations to return back to the ocean. Um, that was actually a story Darwin himself proposed, even though there wasn't um, any fossil evidence of that in his time, but he proposed that we would eventually find those fossils. And that's pretty exciting because that's exactly what we've done. Um, we found fossils that, that, uh, of, of certain features that clearly remind us of, of whale-like creatures. Um, so maybe um, 50 million years ago or so, we kind of named this species the walking whale that also swims. Um, because its limb bones are still strong enough to support its body weight on land, and yet it still kind of has a streamlined body plan for doing some swimming. Um, maybe later um, uh, species or later groups um, changed even more. So maybe this kind of creature definitely could not support its body weight on land. It was exclusively a, um, an aquatic species now, um, but maybe even more streamlined and maybe even more capable of swimming very well to make its living. Um, and then in the modern uh, whale um, species, we see um, uh, almost a complete absence of the hind limbs now um, and an even kind of further development of that swimming body plan. But kind of interestingly, we still see um, fragments or remnants in its uh, skeletal structure of what we call vestigial uh, bone structures. So vestigial structures are simply structures that are so reduced in size that they almost have no use anymore in that creature. And yet what they do is they remind us of their uh, ancestral past. And so they're actually little fragments of a pelvis uh, the purpose of a pelvis bone is to kind of connect your, your limb bones to the rest of the body. Um, and they clearly have no limb bones in the back anymore, but they still have that connector bone um, left in there. So very interesting to see kind of this, this um, prediction that Darwin had long ago be supported by evidence that, that was only found um, after his death. So in summary, we just talked a little bit about the evidence for species actually changing, that they have changed over evolutionary time and they are still changing.